Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Saturday edition of Meteorology Lab. Just checking out the stream here and uh, going to head into the uh, charts. So I've been uh, working a little bit with Megidus here. I've been trying to uh, kind of play around with the two ABI channels to see what happens. If I can kind of like pull out the uh, uh, the, the moisture channel out of this, that, that's something I'm going to have to get into in another webcast. But basically, the uh, difference between the 10.5 and 12 micrometer channels on uh, the new GOES image, the, the new GOES satellite, pretty much corresponds to the water vapor uh, retrieval product there. So I tried to work with it, but uh, the the uh, sensitivity of this data that comes in through Mikaitis is really, I, I guess, uh, <coughs> it's pretty uh, grainy. Let me see if I, no, I, I close that down. Yeah, it was really grainy, and I got to reading and found that you have to kind of merge it with some of the model data so it can get an accurate idea of what the thermal profile is in different parts of the map. I should have left that up there, but basically you would see a whole lot of noise. Some areas would be kind of light and some would be brown, uh, not brown, uh, black there. So anyway, let's uh, keep things moving. You can see the next system there crossing the Rocky Mountains, and it's got a little bit of that comma structure there. You can almost see a little bit of a wraparound on that back side there. So you would probably analyze a vorticity center right there, maybe a short wave extending down through eastern Arizona. So that's going to be heading for the plains, and that puts this area here under upward motion. So there's going to be a corresponding convergence of the wind field and some pressure falls down at the surface. And we're probably seeing that already today. Down lower you can see some uh, stratocumulus shows up as this slightly lighter gray shade right here. And I'll give it the uh, stratocumulus symbol there. So that extends from about Indianapolis all the way up to the Dakotas. And then the higher stratiform clouds are going to be these things here. So that's a lot of cirrus and a little bit of alto stratus and alto cumulus. And it looks like uh, some convective elements right there from Kentucky down to the South Dakota area. So we'll be looking for that on the uh, other products. For example, radar. That corresponds uh, pretty well to those convective elements that we saw. Some heavier uh, showers across North Carolina and the Appalachians there. And uh, we'll take that down to the surface chart. And we can see that that zone there it's pretty much in that warm overrunning sector. This is pretty much, for the most part, a warm front. And that's moving toward that area right there. So what we're getting is flow from the Gulf of Mexico up and over the frontal surface. And that locally enhances the shower activity that we've got in that same area right there. Air Clinic Zone over the uh, boot hill of Missouri. Looks like we got a bit of a cold front. That was kind of unexpected across North Texas. And then that connects back up through New Mexico up to Wyoming to our next system there. And that's pretty far up north there. And not as much of a reflection in Nevada as I would have thought there. That upper level system located right there across New Mexico. So it looks like that's mostly an upper level system. And let me just check and make sure that that's valid. Um, it looks good here. I would have expected more of a surface reflection out west. So let me take a quick look and uh, see how things compare to the Canadian chart. And let's see, 25th 0 Z. Yeah, that looks good. Low pressure right there over Tennessee. So indeed, we're getting a little bit of a weak Canadian cold front moving into Texas there, and not much reflection of that system over New Mexico there. So that's mostly a mid and upper level system moving through that region right there. However, that will be crossing 
over to Texas and Oklahoma, and we'll probably see the impact of that over the next 24 hours. The cold air up in the northeast, we can see that that's driven by this big 1042 millibar high over Quebec. So lots of cold air advection coming south across the Great Lakes into the Midwest. And then on the other side, we've got the warm air advection from the Dakotas all the way up to Manitoba there. Out uh, to the west there in the these red lines, these are the thickness lines here. These are calibrated in decameters. And we can see this thermal troughing on the west coast indicating a cold air mass coming on shore right there. So somewhere between that cold air mass and uh, the warm air advection, the warm air across Texas, there is going to be a cold front in this area. So that might be what this is. So maybe we need to be looking at that region a little more carefully. See something like that right there. Okay, so that looks uh, probably a little bit better than what they're showing here. All right, let's go to the uh, other charts and uh, keep things moving along. There's our uh, thermal structure there. So this is a good opportunity to see what's going on there in Nevada. And certainly we can see a th thickness gradient right there from Las Vegas all the way up to Oregon. So I think we're definitely justified putting a front through Southern California, maybe to this uh, little area of precip offshore. And this probably connects up to this Wyoming system, kind of like that right there. And then I think that tail end probably connects back up into Texas like that. And there we go. I think that's a pretty coherent picture of what our fronts are doing. So except for that little dog leg up, dog leg up to Wyoming, I think that falls pretty closely in line with what we've got there on the uh, surface charts. And the core of the cold air mass, western Oregon right there. So we'll probably come back and try to look at that sounding there. Take a look at the uh, Salem sounding. Alright, we can take a look at the uh, mesoscale. We've got uh, weather going on in California. So let's see if we can see any reflection of that at the surface. The uh, current chart is going to be about right here, and we can see the San Joaquin Valley is northwesterly in that area right there. The winds are coming around out of the uh, northwest like that. So that's a good sign. We've probably had a cold air mass passage, pa passage through there. And let's see if that comes across into the Mojave Desert. You can see the winds picking up there out of the west, but... Uh, pretty difficult to find there at the surface. And then on the uh, next chart for tomorrow we can see a very strong westerly component in Arizona. So a lot of it's probably crossing the Rocky Mountains at that point. So let's see how things are looking on the other side. Yeah, I think that's going to be the one we want since we have uh, some severe weather in the forecast. Okay, we'll stop this about right there, and that's the uh, current chart. You can definitely see a wave structure there in southeastern Oklahoma there. And then that connects up to Tennessee. And then on the other side, we're looking at something like that right there. So upslope flow in uh, northwest Texas into the uh, panhandles in west Texas right there. So that's uh, giving us some lift based at the surface. And let's see how things continue overnight. Things are kind of stationary in the Dallas area. Further west, I think our boundary is probably moving a little further north like that, up to the uh, northern Cap Rock. And then as the day goes on tomorrow, Looks like that warm sector builds in pretty strongly in the I-20 area. And the NAM going for a little bit of a warm front from about Shreveport to uh, the Dallas area and out around, uh, looks like around Turkey, Texas. And this is about uh, 2 p.m. there.
so this is getting close to convection time we can see very strong uh, very hot temperatures in the southern cap rock temperatures coming up to the uh, mid 80s in that area and I think we've probably got a dry line running something something like that that definitely explains these cooler temperatures 77 in junction 76 at uh, temple and so on so this is probably all cloud covered to a certain extent maybe some elevated convection in that area and then on the other side this is all the dry air mass so the triple point that's pretty easy to find we can just shade the moist sector so this is our moisture and we just go to the northwestern tip and that puts us right around Seymour um, maybe just south of Vernon Albany and one more city I'm trying to remember the name uh, just north I'm thinking in the Knox City area yeah that that would, would probably be what I would be looking at for a target there at least uh, tentatively and maybe a few other targets down the dry line in this area and possibly along the warm front though early in the season this is this tends to be a little more sketchy all right then going forward the uh, warm sector builds northward very strong cold air advection across Arkansas and Oklahoma there so that's keeping the front kind of quasi stationary through there and then we go overnight and looks like the cold front is coming out of maybe coming out of New Mexico awfully strong westerly component in that, in that area and then for Monday another warm day in West Oklahoma there looks like a repeat of Northwest Texas except now we're in western Oklahoma there so maybe a dry line like that see the very strong warming right there around Altus and Elk City cold front coming south and then somewhere in here probably also a warm front so at this point uh, depending on how much moisture we have I think we might be looking at maybe Oklahoma for a convection on Monday and sure enough looks like uh, some convective elements all the way from Oklahoma down to Northwest Texas it looks like uh, maybe stronger signal for convection in Northwest Texas and then we see this outflow driven surge moving pretty much down 287 and towards uh, Fort Worth and mineral wells so we'll just kind of wait and see how that goes. So that's our sneak peek at uh, Sunday and Monday. And the reason I threw that sneak peek in there is so we have an idea what to look for as we look through the remainder of the uh, charts, like the uh, satellite in the skew -T. So let's see how uh, Fort Worth looks right now. Lots of uh, dry air all the way up to about 15, 20,000 feet above that quite a bit of upper level moisture very uh, zonal winds in the mid and upper levels and very warm column almost touching that 30 Celsius isotherm right there not a whole lot of uh, capping showing up at this point either though usually as the moisture starts building in that becomes a little bit more apparent let's try Del Rio there's some of that moisture coming in looks like a upper 50s dew points in that region topping out at about two to three thousand feet and let's try going a little further south to Corpus Christi and moisture improves quite a bit five thousand feet deep and dew points running from the mid to I'm gonna say probably low to mid 60s there but still that's pretty significant and definitely we got a cap in that region if we try to get convection going in that area we'd be looking at, at a convective temperature of about 43 Celsius and that's going to be close to about 107 108 Fahrenheit but uh, if you're able to get that kind of heat though you'd have some tremendous cape So anyway, uh, that's a look at the uh, kind of moisture we could be 
seeing in the area tomorrow, depending on how much advection we have overnight. Okay, let me uh, check the stream and uh, see how things are looking. Move the uh, mic so I can read this a little bit better. We got uh, Ron Chalfant here, out there in Southern California, Electric Dog, Erica Baker, reporting uh, mid or reporting 70s in Coffeyville, Kansas. Winds out of the north there. Shirley Keast reporting 25 in Michigan. Ron Chalfant reporting 43 in Crestline, California. Partly cloudy, looking for a little snow tonight. Electric Dog uh, has got 38 there in east, northeast, north Illinois. I think I need to read that as 38 and east, northeast winds in north Illinois. Fun with Tech is here. Got Carl Berghoff here, Meat Puppets. Mentioning Formula One there in Australia this weekend. Seven Celsius in the UK. Cloudy and uninteresting. Mike Estrick reporting 60 in Denver with windy conditions as that system comes out of the Rockies there. Adam Davis reporting Clarion, sunny and about average temperature, 46 today. Jeff Crobb has got overtime there. Manning the fort there at NOAA. And I appreciate you joining. Fun with Tech is asking about the analysis type. I don't know what kind of... I don't know. I'm, I, I change it all the time. But I'll take a quick look here. I'm just using a plain nearest neighbor 60 by 60 grid. So those are the settings I've got. Sometimes I use Cressman and Barnes, but uh, they take a little longer, and I prefer the charts come up pretty quickly during the webcast. So Meat Puppet is up late here. Jeff Crobb has been putting in the overtime. Jeff Crobb uh, is watching Go17 unfold also. I appreciate the uh, comments there, Carl Berghoff, and uh, let me just kind of scroll through here. Alex Front asking about a way to determine if a me lifting mechanism will be sufficient to lift a surface parcel to the LFC. There unfortunately is not, and that's really where the art of forecasting comes into play because there's a lot of chaos in the system and you know you're talking about all kinds of for example let me think here so you've uh, analyzed uh, the sounding at Oklahoma City and you're looking for convection maybe over Elk City for example like out over I-40 out to the west now one problem out there is that if you've ever looked at a topographic map of western Oklahoma, you've seen that it's kind of hilly out there. And you've got 300 to 400 feet of difference easy, maybe 500. And that can have a tremendous effect on the air mass. It can vary the depth of the moist layer. Now what if you throw in wind and now you've got that undulating moist layer, it's rolling kind of like a uh, toy, yeah, like like a toilet paper roll on the desk, like uh, if you picture it kind of lifting up moisture, for example, kind of like a weak plume of moisture, kind of lifts up very gently. So there's all these small scale effects taking place and uh, even boundaries that are like poorly resolved, for example, that you can barely see in the surface data, that can have an effect too. And it's all these processes, they're very subtle. And it's very easy to overlook the impact of each of those. And that's the reason we have uh, surprises out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, Chuck Doswell's got a famous quote about that. 
that forecasting kind of boils down to mesoscale accidents. Now, yes, you can solve for a lot of these things and kind of calculate the uh, vertical motion, but that's only an approximation and kind of a very poor one. So the models are definitely getting much better at it, but you'll notice that uh, like the forecast, for example, I'm just going to kind of skip ahead here and show you this real quick. The forecast for tomorrow it, at the time we do the uh, weather. Give me just a second here. Yeah, this is the uh, forecast of the uh, precip fields 24 hours from now. And I would guarantee you that this pre the, the precip that it shows here, we're going to see a much different pattern most likely. Like these little specks, these are going to be in different places almost for sure there. The general overall pattern is probably going to be pretty accurate, but this far out, that kind of shows you the uncertainty that we have in the mesoscale models even at this point. Uh, Carl Berghoff mentioning uh, gusty winds. I'm not sure what the discussion's about. I kind of got lost there. Anyway, yeah, very good. Let's go ahead and push on and take a look at the uh, satellite. So back to the satellite. This is the uh, water vapor imagery. So this is that combination of the 10 point, I don't know the exact numbers, it's like 10.5 and 12 micrometers, but uh, basically the difference between that with some other uh, calculations there with the uh, current data gives us this picture here. So this is actually factoring in a little bit of the uh, model data. So we've got that uh, subtropical jet uh, maybe paired up with the polar front jet. And we can see this bear clinic system right there. That's the same one we saw on the uh, Mikaitis imagery. And there's that locally enhanced upward motion in the mid and upper troposphere across uh, Albuquerque down to about uh, Safford, Arizona. And that's about to come out into the uh, plains itself. And let's take a, no, another look at that from the uh, western satellite. And it's uh, definitely good to switch when you're looking at uh, water vapor imagery because of the problem of foreshortening. You notice that when you get way over to the uh, western horizon, like way out here in the Pacific, you start uh, losing not only resolution, but you're penetrating more through the atmosphere and you get more attenuation of the radiation. So that's the reason we want to switch over and look at the uh, goes west sector as we're looking over California like that. So there's where uh, Ranch Alfon is underneath that jet and most likely the uh, location of the jet. Probably uh, running something like that right there. So maybe northwest Arizona down to uh, southern California. And there's the uh, subsonant side of the jet and there's the ascending side of the jet. And uh, yeah, that can be a very potent area for clear air turbulence. So probably kind of a bumpy uh, ride there in Arizona this evening. All right, uh, let's see. We've got uh, our system coming out of the Rockies, and I think the best way to introduce it would be to use the uh, mid-level products like the uh, heights and vorticity. So let's start out with the picture right now. It's like we got some large scale ridging across the uh, lower plains. The flow is out of the uh, southwest across New Mexico. And these yellow areas, these represent, I guess you can call that uh, areas of enhanced upper level lift. The lift is actually just out kind of ahead of that. But uh, this kind of clues us into the structure of that uh, energy field. So we can see overnight looks like some this uh, short wave right here coming out of New Mexico. So there'll be some lift working on the panhandle in southwest Kansas tonight. 
and that moves up into northern Oklahoma and Kansas towards dawn. The best lift is out in this area here. And looks like another area of lift coming out of New Mexico, affecting that area there at dawn. So these are progressing very rapidly from west to east. And tomorrow at convection time, we're going to have southwesterly flow there. However, it doesn't look like there's any concentrated upper level lift working on the environment. So it's going to basically come down to the lower level boundaries out in this area here. And we were looking at Seymour. So this does actually kind of make it a little bit less complicated there. Looks like after dark though, another area of lift coming out of uh, New Mexico. So it looks like our best lift comes out after dark. The upper level patterns are a little bit out of phase with the surface heating. Usually we, we like to see things looking kind of like this or like that around convection time. Unfortunately, this is around midnight. So the upper level dynamics are going to be kind of late. And what that can mean is if you're strongly capped, that would mean you're going to remain capped. So we're going to have to look at the upper level. Uh, we're going to have to look at the sounding there. Let's look at forecast sounding. I'm going to bring up uh, Seymour. So this is valid at... Uh, This is about around 1 p.m. Looks like we do have a little bit of warm air up at 850 millibar, so this would be indicating a little bit of capping. So let's see. Yeah, the, the capping is a little bit on the weak side tomorrow. Let me advance this up to about 4 p.m. Hang on a second. Okay, yeah, that's zero Z right there. Let me try to get this in the uh, best moisture area. So what I'm trying to do here is try to, trying to get a look at what the cap looks like tomorrow. And I don't really see much of anything there. So weekly capped, I think we actually may be looking at numerous cells up in northwest Texas in that area. So maybe uh, convection getting going a little bit early, maybe towards uh, 2 to 3, perhaps, maybe earlier. And I would be looking at maybe clustered cells if they do get going. Then let's see how things look for Monday. Things are a little bit more out of the southwest. So the flow may be coming a little bit more unidirectional here. Flow has a really channeled look because the uh, vorticity lobes are kind of paralleling these height lines. So this is indicating that the dynamics will be mostly in the form of jet streaks coming out of Mexico right there. So this is really where your uh, divergent quadrants come into play here. So the uh, best upper level lift will probably be up in this area and it looks kind of neutral for that area right there. So we'll see how things look at the surface on Monday. And then after that it looks like uh, the dynamics, the stronger dynamics start to come out of the Rockies around midweek and we'll just kind of look at the GFS at that point. So we'll go ahead and put it together with the uh, 3 kilometer NAM. Okay, overnight. So yeah, there's our first shot of energy coming out of New Mexico. So this is around midnight. And this is the lift coming out of that region back here. So it moves pretty quickly up into Kansas and Oklahoma by dawn. There's very little left, and it looks like we do get some elevated showers developing around Fort Worth, developing, I guess, around Abilene, and then progressing towards Fort Worth before dawn there. And then we see this uh, trough establish itself. That's probably the warm front right there. And then, uh, let's see here, by evening, 
couple of elevated showers, but uh, NAM is not very keen on developing that. You know, I would certainly go up and chase it if things looked uh, good tomorrow morning. However, again, this is indicating that a lot of the uh, better activity will be tied to the upper level lift. And there it is at midnight. So that's going to be affecting mostly the area just northwest of Abilene there. And then it dissipates around 3 a.m., just uh, some upper level stuff along the Red River. And then around uh, San Angelo, looks like a uh, brief window of convection in that area. And then we're looking at Monday. It looks like a little bit stronger development as the lower heights, cold air upper level temperatures come out of the Rockies right there. So we start getting that skew T leaning over to the to the left there instead of like that. So the skew T kind of leans over progressively to the left like that. And as a result we get higher capes and uh, more instability. And it uh, looks like we're looking again at uh, northwest Texas and parts of uh, southwestern Oklahoma. Developing into an MCS there around midnight. And then after that, we're going to have to pick up the uh, GFS at that point. So if you're in northwest Texas, uh, that's a good place to be for the next uh, couple of days. And then things will be moving out into eastern Oklahoma and the rest of Texas around Tuesday into uh, Wednesday. All right, so let's see. We've gone on for about 33 minutes here. Let's uh, just look at the rest of the forecast on the GFS. So we've talked about these uh, storms developing along that front right there. We can see on the uh, synoptic scale picture this we take in the, the whole big picture, we can see the, the cold front. You can see that very well. This, this is uh, for Monday morning here. It's good to kind of pull back there and look at the uh, large scale picture. So we see the cold air mass over the Great Basin area and the warm sector coming up north. And then we can see that, yeah, there is a synoptic scale front in Texas and Oklahoma there. And that can be important because as you can see we get one wave moving up into the St. Louis area in northern Missouri during the day on Monday. So that's how the picture looks on Monday evening. So yeah, there's some uh, showers there in northwest Texas, but also looks like we're going to have to keep our eye on the St. Louis area. And then for Tuesday, looks like an early MCS coming out into uh, Little Rock, eastern Oklahoma, and Dallas. And then for evening, looks like a couple of... Uh, couple of uh, inverted troughs there in Texas. So I think what we're seeing here is probably a bit of a warm front redeveloping out in this area here. You can see the uh, thickness lines kind of packed like that and then the cold front itself coming into Mexico like that. So it looks like uh, our system kind of splits up into two here. And now we're looking at uh, some action there in Texas for Wednesday and Thursday. Okay, so later, let's see, Thursday, system moves out into the uh, southeast U.S., and then cold air pushing in for the weekend. So it looks like we're going to actually have a dry weekend coming up for the 1st of April. And then we get our, our Alberta Clipper coming out of Kansas, Kansas right there. See that cold air mass up to the north? That's going to spread southward. Big old uh, 1035 millibar high. And it's looking a little bit like winter there, getting into the first couple days of April. Looks like it'll be kind of dry. You can see the, most of the packing of the isobars are in Mexico. 
not as much out in the Gulf of Mexico. So it looks like it'll start out kind of dry there as this system pushes south. In fact, it goes way over to the southwest here. So yeah, it looks like this is going to be kind of dry for the first of the week around the first, second, and third of April. And then our cold front builds southward. So there's our fronts right there. Kind of a weak system up in the northeast. Uh, some snow for upstate New York and the uh, eastern Great Lakes. And then we get a couple of opportunities here for storms. Maybe around April 6th. This is pretty far off, but uh, we'll keep our eye on that. That's got some severe weather potential. And then another progressive system moving into the plains for the 8th. Subject to uh, change, of course. And we get to the end of the uh, chart sequence there. So on this uh, fair weather day, that's about all I got. Uh, let me take one last look at the chat and uh, see what's going on. Jeff Crobb reporting the first official visible imagery from the new satellite will be May 5th through 6th. Lots of testing. They just turned on the ABI. Outgassing is progressing now. So I appreciate that update, uh, Jeff. Alex Front says, oh my gosh, winter go away. Yeah, we're sweating down here too. All right, and Adam Davis working on moving to Springfield, Branson after graduation. Maybe can start chasing there. All right, uh, yeah, good luck. And uh, for everybody else, uh, hope you have a good evening, and we'll see you tomorrow. Take care.